Good morning. Happy Lord's Day to you. This is Riley Brannon, and I've got a message for you. Um, I actually, I want to start by asking a question. Are Christians to celebrate the Passover? It's that time of year, according to the Hebrew calendar, where uh, Jewish people all over the world are going to be celebrating the Passover. It actually will begin this Monday, tomorrow, and it'll stretch on over to seven days till next Monday. Um, and this has been going on since... Exodus chapter 12, since the days of Moses and the Israelites when they were first uh, being delivered out of Egypt to come into the promised land. And I won't go through all the verses because I don't have a whole lot of time. But I will tell you, if you look in Exodus chapter 12, specifically verses 5 and 6, from 5 all the way to the end of the chapter, it talks about how God instituted this covenant or ordinance with the Israelite people to bring about the Passover that's Exodus chapter 12. Well, that was in the Old Covenant. Christians, when they read the Bible, they need to learn to distinguish between the, the, the covenant made with Abraham, the covenant made with Moses, and the covenant made uh, or fulfilled. Excuse me. The covenant made with Abraham, Moses, and then the covenant which was fulfilled in Christ. And how that... Uh, how that applies to the Christian, what that means for the Christian and how he lives. So, if the Old Covenant was fulfilled in Christ, which is what the Bible teaches us, And some of the laws that went along with the Old Covenant, like you know, not wearing certain fabrics, fabrics that are mixed with cotton and maybe polyester, in the Old Covenant, in the book of Leviticus, that was condemned. Uh, and so were all, also uh, certain food laws, like you can't eat this or can't eat that. Now, it is my conviction that those were traditional laws given to Israel to separate them from the pagan nations. And that when Christ fulfilled that covenant on the cross, a lot of those laws were done away with. But now, like the laws of the Ten Commandments were not done away with. That's what we call the moral law. The ceremonial laws were the food laws and fabric laws. But the Ten Commandments applies universally to all people throughout all generations. However, Christ said in Matthew chapter 22 that those commandments are fulfilled in these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why am I saying all this? Because there are certain things about the Old Covenant that, that, that are not done away with. We don't destroy. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I come to fulfill it. In Christ, they're fulfilled. And now if you receive Christ by faith and what he did on the cross, you too, through Christ, fulfilled those. And so you don't have to worry about wearing certain fabrics. That was the law of Moses. In the law of Christ, those have been fulfilled perfectly. You don't have to worry about fabrics. You don't have to worry about certain food laws. Although you should take care of your body. And you should watch how you dress. We want to dress modestly. And we, we don't want to be gluttons, right? So, the Passover. Was that fulfilled in Christ? Is something that we don't have to worry about anymore? I think no. And I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter... First Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to show you, I do believe the Christian should keep the Passover, just not in the way you would think. And now while I'm going over there, I want to say something about Jesus Christ and the Last Supper. Jesus Christ, it is widely accepted by almost all Christians. And there may be, there's a few out there that don't accept this, but for the majority that I know of, most fundamental true Orthodox Christians accept the fact that 
the Last Supper, Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples before he went to the cross, where he instituted the, um, the Lord's Supper, where we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, um, was instituted on the Passover in his day. His Last Supper was the Passover meal of his day. It was sort of Jesus taking the Old Covenant Passover and bringing it into the New Covenant. And now Christians everywhere, all the time, take the, blo the, excuse me, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And we do it not just one time a year at the Passover, but it varies in different churches and in different branches of Christianity. Um, some take it every service, some don't. But uh, it is the observance of all Christians that we drink grape juice or wine and some other denominations and branches of Christianity. And we take of a unleavened piece of bread. And some don't worry about the leaven. They, worry, they just take the piece of bread and we eat it. We drink grape juice or wine, the blood of Jesus, which symbolically represents the blood of Jesus. And we take the body, which symbolically represents his body. Some Christians differ on this. Some say it's actually the body of Jesus Christ and actually the blood. I don't believe the scriptures support that. I believe it is a symbolic reference of what Christ did on the cross. So when we take the grape juice and we take the bread, we remember what Jesus did on the cross. His blood was spilt to make us right before God and to cleanse us of our sins. And his body was broken. That, that, that's to remind us of the heinous nature of sin. So when we take communion, we remember we're cleansed by Jesus' blood. We also remember what it was that put him on the cross. So we stay away from sin. Jesus did that in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to the end of the 26th chapter. And if you want to go back and read that, Exodus 12, Matthew chapter 26, the end of the chapter. Those are good things to read about the Passover. 1 Corinthians is what I want to get to so we can... Uh, so I can keep this in, in a timely manner for my schedule and also for your schedule. I don't want to waste your time. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 4, Paul is addressing the Corinth church about a sin of sexual, sexual immorality that is among them. And he's telling them they need to deal with it. And then he uses the Passover, because apparently at that time when Paul was writing the letter um, to them, when they were having this issue, it was during the Passover. So Paul's connecting the two. He says this, verse 4, I'm going to read from the King James. You can follow along here over to the side. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, my spirit and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Paul's talking about excommunicating or kicking that member out of the church into the world where Satan's sort of ruling and reigning. The destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's kicked out so that maybe he might come to the end of his rope and repent and come back to the church and not commit sexual morality in the church. Your glorifying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He was saying his sexual immorality in the church is affecting everybody in the church. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover, verse 7, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast. Therefore let us keep the feast. Paul, the apostle, instituting the new covenant, or writing about it to the Christians at that time. And I believe Paul was writing to all Christians, not just the Corinthians. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Apostle Paul is telling the early Christians there, keep the feast. Jesus was our Passover. So here's what I believe Paul was teaching. Jesus did fulfill the Passover in his body. He was that lamb from the book of Exodus who was crucified in that blood. 
that blood's not now applied to our literal doorposts, but to the doorposts of our hearts. None of us put red on our doorposts during Passover. Some Christians do as a sort of symbolic statement, but they don't really believe that when they do that, some destroyer is going to fly over and not harm them, which is what happened in Exodus 12. They believe as a, as a symbolic reference, and that's what Passover is. Passover is a matter of the heart. The Apostle Paul says, Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. In Exodus chapter 12, God commanded the Israelites to remove, literally remove, all leaven from their houses, which the leaven represented sin. In the New Testament, Paul says, "Don't, rem don't, not with old leaven. Don't, don't go into your houses and room. That's not a thing. Don't be worried about that." He says, "Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth." What Paul is saying is here is, "Look, now your Passover is about your relationship with God, your heart before God. You need to be worried about your heart. Don't be worried about whether there's leaven in your house or not. Worried about whether there's leaven in your heart." Is there sin in your heart? Are you unrepentant? Is there something in your life that you're hanging on to that you won't let Christ have, that you won't let God have? He's like, get rid of that. Get rid of the malice and the wickedness. I want you to see this here. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. I mean, you don't celebrate with all that stuff in your heart and in your life, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, God is more concerned with you living a sincere Christian life and a truthful life than he is with you having some outward display of Passover, uh, which if you're doing that and you're not taking care of your heart before the Lord, that's hypocrisy. We shouldn't celebrate the Passover as hypocrites. Now, if you are celebrating the Passover, you're keeping your heart open before the Lord, you're repenting, you're living right before God, according to, uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, and then you want to do these outward displays too, there's freedom in the new covenant for that. You can do that. Just don't try to force other Christians, say, telling them that if you're not doing those things and you're not a good Christian, that's, that's adding laws to the new covenant. That's placing, adding to the scripture. God says, do not add to or take away from my word. Paul it makes it real clear. That Christ is our Passover. Verse 7. Christ, our Passover, also has been... For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. For Christ, our Passover. Christ is our Passover. He was that blood, that sacrifice that was made. That, that when we die, the destroyer doesn't get our soul. That Christ, God, gets our soul, gets our life. And so... That's what we ought to be doing at this Passover season. We ought to be keeping our heart before the Lord. And again, if you want to do some outward signs and displays, I believe that's, there's freedom in the new covenant for that. But um, primarily you should be concerned with sincerity and truth, not wickedness and malice. Because you can do all the outward signs you want. You can go to church even. You can read your Bible throughout your entire Christian life. All these outward displays of your faith. But if your heart ain't right before the Lord, you ain't right. It ain't right. It's hypocrisy. We ought to be more concerned with our heart. Are we really living the Christian faith? Are we really living it when nobody's looking? That's what really matters to God. That's what we're going to be judged by on the day of judgment. Your real relationship with God. Not the one that everybody sees. And so, let us keep the Passover in that way. Let us take this time throughout this coming week. When everybody else is celebrating the Passover outwardly, let us celebrate it righteously before God, keeping our hearts open, clean, and clear. And if there's something you're struggling with, maybe there's a sin you can't give up. The Bible doesn't; it has never told us to serve God in our flesh, to just try. It says that we are to come before God. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest for your weary souls. For my burden is easy, my yoke is my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Forgive me. Jesus is saying is, if you've got a problem, you got something you're struggling with, come to me. That's the Christian life. Go to Christ, and Christ, by His Spirit, by His grace, will help you and deliver you. 
And that really is the Christian life. It's real simple. You come to Christ, and when Christ comes into your life and starts working, now you you commit your heart and say, yes, I'm no longer going to deal with that. I'm no longer going to give in to that. I'm going to stand my ground by faith on the grace of Jesus Christ and stand for him and live for him. So there's a delicate balance between giving your sin to God and then coming to that decision where you're not going to do it anymore. But if you're struggling with something, my, my, my sincerest encouragement is go to Christ. Go to Christ, especially during this time when it's all about repentance. And I really believe that's what the Passover is about. Sin is the leaven. And he says, get rid of the leaven. Repent. Repent and put your full faith and trust in Christ and ask for his spirit to come in, heal you, and cleanse you. And uh, I hope I didn't ramble too much there. Uh, may God be with you. May Christ's spirit be in you. May his grace deliver you of all sin. God, I pray that you would help us to cast out the leaven, to cast out the sin, to clean our hearts, to cleanse our houses, our temples. That you might be truly Lord of our hearts and Lord of our lives. That when you do come back, you'll find a faithful people, a repentant people, people trusting in your works, not their own works. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.